All right, our next class at the John David Ebert School for the Study of Culture, Cosmology, and the Arts will be on Jean Gebser and the Ever-Present Origin, chapter by chapter. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the book uh, and read all the chapters. It's divided into two volumes. Um, let's take a look at the uh, Amazon page for it. Uh, here it is. It came out in 1949. And uh, Gene Gebser is absolutely one of the greatest thinkers, philosophers, and cultural critics of the 20th century. There's no doubt about that. The book came out in 1949. Um, Gebser uh, learned, he went to Spain. He was born in Posen, which is now in Poland. Um, so he comes out of a Germanic background. And he went to Spain, mastered the Spanish language, and then became uh, a minister there. I think I have his Wikipedia page up here. Uh, born in 1905 and died in 1973, and uh, then eventually moved to Paris, where he changed his German name Hans to the G the uh, French name Jean. Um, changed it there, and then finally, within uh, 1930, I think it's 39, he left Paris and went to to Switzerland, where he pretty much spent the rest of his life in the Jungian world around Bern. Now um, he is not any, a Jungian, although his book is kind of a reaction. It's kind of a, he's kind of a, a Jungian rebel, um, sort of like a fallen angel who, uh, like the main character of Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, is ready for, to, to combat that which has ejected and rejected him. So uh, he never got a, a university degree, um, but he was a philosopher, linguist, and poet, and uh, of the finest order, in, in my opinion. I have read this book many times, both volumes. Um, and so that's the emphasis of the class. Uh, we will read it chapter by chapter. So, like Spengler's Decline of the West, to which it is largely a response, Gebser has read Spengler, and he's also studied Jung. So in a, from a certain point of view, uh, this book constitutes a, a, a response to both Jung and Spengler. And Jung and Spengler, who would not have liked each other or read each other at all. Um, I remember Jung making a disparaging comment about Spengler and Sp Spengler had no interest in psychoanalysis or any of that, which he regarded as, as decadent. But basically, when you get into, when you learn Jung and you learn um, Spengler, the structure of their thinking is the same. It's, it's basically the, the same, structurally, morphologically considered. Uh, so this book sort of comes out of that. It's sort of a, you might say, thesis, antithesis, and now with Gebser, a, sort of a synthesis. Um, so two volumes, just like Spengler's Decline of the West, Foundations of the Aperspectival World, A Contribution to the History of the Awakening of Consciousness. And then the second volume, which is much lesser read, actually. Uh, I don't hear people talk that much about the second volume. Manifestations of the Aperspectival World, An Attempt at the Concretion of the Spiritual. So the second volume is entirely devoted to studying what this thing is, this consciousness structure, which he calls integral. He divides the, the history of human consciousness into five distinct structures, we have the archaic structure, uh, which is actually ever present. The archaic structure is the ground of origin from out of which these other structures, uh, the German title is Ursprung und Gegenwart. And Ursprung means a sort of a twisting, turning mutation uh, coming out of a basic ground of being. And that ground of being is the ever present origin of the archaic consciousness structure. Um, and then along, somewhere in the Paleolithic, uh, we get the magical consciousness structure which he says is one-dimensional. Um, and then uh, the mythical consciousness structure comes in during the Neolithic with the rise of the agrarian village world and the great goddess, the great mother of the earth, and the myth of human sacrifice. All of that brings in the mythical consciousness structure, which goes all the way down through uh, what Arnold Toynbee calls the first generation of high civilization with the Sumerians, the Sumero babylonians uh, and, the, um, and, and the Egyptians. And so it continues through that. But then with the Greeks, we get a different, a new structure of consciousness, the mental consciousness structure, mental slash rational consciousness structure. And that, that comes into being then with the Greeks. And we have been studying uh, the evolution of media studies in the class that we are just working on right now, a lot of which overlaps with Gebser, especially Willem Flusser, who is more or less stolen uh, from Gebser, the, the, these phases of consciousness in his book uh, Into the Universe of Technical Images. Uh, he, pretty much he's taken it without citation from, from Gebser, the, these 
uh, mutations in the history of human consciousness. And so, because they're mutations, then, um, they are not caused. They're not caused by something. Uh, in German evolutionary theory from Goethe uh, all the way down to Hugo de Vries, uh, mutations are not caused. They just happen. They're spontaneous. Uh, so it's not a matter of causality here. So in that respect, Gebser is coming out of the German idealist tradition, uh, especially the Goethean uh, st strain of it. Uh, Goethe, when he explains the metamorphosis of plants, does not tell you why one phase of it is follows another phase, what the cause of it is. There is no cause. Uh, or if there are, there are, there are the metaphysical causes of the formal causes of Plato and the final causes of Aristotle. Um, so that's the sort of kind of thinking that Gebser is bringing to uh, this history of the human consciousness structures. And then so, in a way, what he does is he takes Jungian's, collect, Jung, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, which with, with Jung it's just kind of a scrap heap. It's, it's a midden heap of junked uh, myths and religions and signifiers. Um, it, it's kind of a, a junkyard. And what Gebser does is he comes into that junkyard of the collective unconscious and he gives it structure. He approaches it as though it has strata. Each one of these consciousness structures lay on top of, lie on top of the previous one like a series of geological, geomorphic strata. Um, so it's really fascinating. So we'll get into all of this. And as I say, with part two, in, in part one, he goes through the consciousness structures uh, and then sees the, the aperspectival slash integral consciousness structure coming into being uh, in the middle of the 19th century with modernist art. And that's all uh, what part two is about. The manifestations of the aperspectival world um, comes in with uh, Cezanne, and, and Man starting with Manet, but then also Cezanne and Van Gogh and Gauguin. <clears throat> and ultimately for him, uh, Picasso is, is like the great exemplar of the integral consciousness, which includes multiple temporalities, multiple spatialities, all at the same time. With a cubist uh, painting, you were getting the object looked at simultaneously from multiple points in space and multiple points in time. So it's a new consciousness structure that he sees coming in here. And so in the second volume, he goes through the natural sciences and examines uh, the, what the implications of the integral are for things like Einstein's unification of space and time to a four-dimensional. Uh, for him, the integral consciousness structure is, is four-dimensional. Uh, and then he goes through, uh, let's see, he goes through physics and poetry and literature, uh, the novel, architecture, um, and examines all of that, that that goes on from about everything that goes on in Europe from about 1860 or so down to the time at which he was writing this and published it in 1949. He was probably writing it for about a decade before that. Um, okay, so uh, come join us. Um, we will have a lot of fun with this book. Um, we will read probably uh, two to three chapters a week, depending on the length of the chapters. For the first class, we'll do uh, chapters one and two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then um, part two, the chapters tend to get shorter. So um, with part two, we'll read uh, chapters one, two, and three, then four and five, uh, six, seven, and eight, and finally nine, 10, and 11, and 12. Those are all shorter chapters. So we can group them together that way and uh, read through this this masterpiece. The price for the class is $250. Um, I do have previous classes on uh, a whole bunch of them. They only allow you to advertise three of them here. Uh, the Philosophy, Mythology, and Cosmology of Rudolf Steiner. Uh, th those classes are all available for $150. Uh, the Philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, a guided tour. Also, all those classes. In most cases, it's eight classes. Eight lectures plus eight class discussions, all video recorded from Zoom. That's what you would be purchasing as a bundle here. And the current course is still $250 because we're still in the middle of it right now, the evolution of media studies. But we have done quite a few other classes. Some, I think we're approaching about 15 classes now. So if you're interested in purchasing any of those other classes, uh, just hit me up at my uh, Gmail, which is johndavidebert at gmail.com. I also do astrology readings as well, and those are not free. I charge for those. The typical astrologers, the, the typical astrologers fee of $150 for a one-hour reading on Zoom. Uh, that's even cheaper than some astrologers. 
So uh, that's it. Um, I look forward. Come join us. Have fun. We'll have coffee and conversation uh, discussing Gene Gebser. I'll see you in class.